Okay, so anything you now say is recorded for posterity's sake. So um, we're going to now look at, uh, at, at Jesus kind of growing up and what's kind of going on. Um, it's just, again, it's, I, find, I find these things help add kind of colour and understanding um, just to, to the story. Um, that, you know, they're, they're not vital to understanding and knowing the gospel. Um, but it's nice to see, um, it's nice to see how sound historically the gospel is. I can put it that way, <laughs> you know, that um, uh, in the spectrum of how people hold faith, you will always have those who kind of almost wear as a badge that their faith is unreasonable because faith is not rational. They feel it's kind of almost the more unreasonable. So, you know, if if the Bible said that, that the Lord was a great jelly donut, I would just believe it because I want to believe it. And that somehow is my virtue, my faith goes that way i've always sat somewhere more in the middle i like i believe that somehow god's given us brains and rationality and somehow we look at things if they didn't make sense we would dismiss this book if that makes sense but they make sense in such remarkable ways that there are things in this book that don't make sense but i trust them because so much of it fits does that make sense yeah. so that that's if you like the approach i try and take which is I can't say exactly where do you draw the line, but somehow it's a mix of saying if, if this didn't fit at all, then we wouldn't still be reading it 2000 years later and um, and actually seeing things in it, remarkable things in it. But because it does fit so well and sometimes it, uh, an idea goes out of fashion and people say it didn't work. And then suddenly 100 years later, you discover that that was wrong. It was a total <coughs> dead end alley and we're back to believing it again. Um, but even when that's going on, you find that the other parts that are still kind of surprising people the whole time. And that, that's often the way. So that's partly, again, I kind of explain why it is I like to look at the history. So anyway, we're coming back to the story. Um, so uh, Joseph arose and he took the young child and his mother and they came to the land of Israel. But when they heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father, Herod, uh, his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. So we, we understand that now. <laughs> you can imagine, obviously, that, that route coming back. So it comes along the top of Egypt, comes up the kind of the, 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 the kind of boot bit of the, the Sinai Peninsula, um, up through kind of the Phoenician areas. And as he's coming up there and coming into South Judea, um, as he's getting there and he's talking, he's hearing stories of what's been going on with Archelaus. And actually, that doesn't seem so good. And he's warned in a dream as he goes to bed, goes to sleep and thinks, you know what? Living in this area is a dangerous place. Um, and so he withdraws to the region of Galilee. Um, just an interesting little comment here, because I don't think I've touched on it already. But um, we're told explicitly in Scripture that Mary is of the town of Nazareth. And she is betrothed to a man who's living there. But we never told that actually that's his town. Um, and, and Nazareth, as we're going to, sorry, Joseph, as we can see, he is a builder. That's what the tecton means. It's someone who works in building sites. He might work with wood, but he might not as well. There's no reason why a tecton has to work with wood. <laughs> um, so and uh, so he goes where the work is, like a lot of those kinds of trades. Um, and so actually, it's quite possible that that he has other connections. He, we know he probably has family down around Bethlehem and so on probably is a bit more spread out. Um, they're not a landowning family. All the landowning families are exceedingly wealthy. And so he has to kind of move. And he's not like a fisherman who has to stay in one spot because that's where they cast off. He's, he's someone who probably migrates to some degree amongst different family members in different places. Um, so that doesn't mean to say he's not spent considerable time in Nazareth, but just saying we're told Mary is of Nazareth, but not necessarily that Joseph is. But he, they head back up to the region of Galilee. And as they get there, of course, what they discover, um, as they return from the south, Joseph hears about Archelaus. Oh, yeah, he gets nervous. God warns him. They return to Nazareth. Um, they discover, of course, that um, Sepphoris is going to be rebuilt. <laughs> and that's only three and a half miles north of the town that we know Mary belongs to. So she will have family there. She'll have friends and connections. And Joseph knows people there because he was living there when they were betrothed. So he's met Mary where they've been betrothed. So it makes sense to go back to Nazareth um, for, for very simple economic reasons. <laughs> well, both social and economic. We've got connections there. We've both got connections. Mary has presumably, as I said, grown up there. He's, he at least knows people. There's now work three and a half miles to the north as the city of, of Sepphoris is being uh, being rebuilt at this point. 
so the infrastructure has just started started happening the infrastructure work so and um, the first thing that happens of course is often the way is they build roads because you're going to need to bring lots of building materials in so there's um, road uh, road building work starting um, uh, and Josephus then refers to it in during this period as the work happens as being the, the jewel of Galilee um, it's the strongest city in Galilee as well according to Josephus um, so there is actually going to be plenty of work for a tecton the, uh, um, who's actually living in Nazareth three miles south um, you've probably seen it but it, obviously the in in the English word architect is an architecton archi is in top and tecton is a master so the master builder is an architecton Paul says you know I'm I work alongside Jesus as a master builder you notice that when he he's actually making he's actually talking about something that he that the ancient church understood about Jesus which is he's a tecton <laughs> Um, but what's happened in our kind of in the romantic image, it's turned into a carpenter who has his own little shop, um, and he w and and he b makes chairs and tables and furniture and so on, um, rather than the much more um, kind of uh, construction industry role, which is it is much more in keeping with it. So um, actually, and at the same time, um, Antipas decides to set, set a different kind of tone to his brother Archelaus or his half brother Archelaus in the south. Um, so he wants to work with the Pharisees. He sees their influence. Um, so he sets a, a much more cooperative note um, uh, than either his father or his brother down in the south. So Galilee becomes a very good place to, to grow up. And um, for the next kind of 10 or 20 years or so, it is actually going to be predominantly, much, much more so than down in the south, where there's still all sorts of politics going on. Uh, it's going to become a stable, safe place. Um, it actually becomes an area for, for uh, countless waves of kind of new building work. After Sepphoris is finished, they start building Tiberias, um, a large city on the coast of, of um, the Lake of Galilee and so on. So it kind of constantly is, uh, is there's, there's, um, there's kind of good employment, uh, it, it prospers, it's doing well, well, it becomes kind of a wealthy sort of a town. Um, uh, which actually is in contrast, if you remember, to a few weeks ago, well, a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, <laughs> When we, we saw when Joseph goes to the temple and he gives the poor man's offering of two turtle doves for his son, because the things are hard up at that point. But actually they're moving into an area that is going to prosper. It's got lots of building work. Um, I always think there's something nice in terms of the provision of the Lord in that. You know, it's, you just stop and think about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's, there's something actually in Jesus. Because in, in Proverbs 8, you know, it, it refers to wisdom who is alongside God as a master workman. That's what it says in, um, in, in wisdom who is alongside God as a master workman is, is um, the word. Um, it's called that by Philo, the Jewish theologian says that the, the wisdom was God's word. It's, the, it's part of the Trinity, i.e. is Jesus. So the pre-incarnate Jesus was a workman alongside the Father. And as he comes in life, he becomes a workman alongside his earthly father and his heavenly father. Does that make sense? And in that context, his heavenly father provides for them <laughs> with the economics changing really on the personality of the leader um, who takes a, a different approach rather than kind of shock and awe, making people fearful of him and doing what he says. He tries to win them over and uh, and so on. So. So here is his uh, his Sepphoris from the top. You can just kind of get some of the Roman roads that you can still see. Nice thing is little thing to note is it actually has an amphitheater, um, because Jesus uses an import word which there's no um, Jewish equivalent, which is um, you hypocrite, which is the which is an actor in the theater. Um, and so when Jesus said that, he must have used he must have used the borrowed word. And um, cultural words transfer from language to language first. It's just one of those. Uh, so words to do. So so we all play the piano. OK, piano is a, an Italian word, isn't it? You see piano forte. Uh, but we don't think of it like that because it, the, it's invented one place. It moves. So hypocrite is a Greek word for a play actor. <laughs> um, and there is no equivalent, really, in, in Judaism, in, in, in Aramaic or Hebrew. But Jesus is using it because he's grown up with people who understand. Um, interestingly, I say interestingly, is um, we pick up from Josephus and some other, and the rab some of the rabbinic writers, I think as well. I can't quote the exact source, but that um, that this was a little bit of a place where the, the priests at play um, weren't always they didn't always kind of live up to their um, to the way they like to present themselves when they're down at the temple. Um, so there's a, Jesus has probably grown up very aware of this. 
um, because they they are seen and um, so the the theatre should for a real religious due should be out of bounds but it seems that when the priests are up there on holiday it's kind of when in Sepphoris do as the Romans do if you know what I mean <laughs> they, they they kind of live a bit more in the kind of the Roman way rather than the Jewish way when they're there so it's a bit of a kind of a, a holiday resort um, meanwhile meanwhile back in the south <laughs> Um, Archelaus is continuing in his father's footsteps. He keeps on executing people. Um, and by 6 AD, oh, this is where Jews and the Samaritans, that's it, it wasn't the, it wasn't the early one. It wasn't, it, this is the time. It's been so bad, he's, he's, he's been so aggressive and violent in the south that they, they, they come together and form an alliance and they send a delegation to Caesar to complain. Um, and this time, um, Rome sides with the people against Archelaus and depose him. And he drops from history. We don't know what happens to him um, after this. And um, he, so he's banished. And actually, this is where Quirinius is, becomes officially the civil legate of Judea. So we were thinking of him before he was when he had the military legate role up in uh, up in Galilee, covering Galilee. It's a slightly broader um, uh, broader kind of uh, role. But now he's uh, officially made the civil legate down to basically cover the territory that Herod um, Archelaus was ruling and it stops becoming a kingdom anymore. So Jerusalem now is in a city that is now a province of, of the Roman Empire rather than the kingdom in its own right. Um, so um, it's Quirinius then who appoints Annas to become the high priest in 6 AD. Um, and Annas, of course, will dominate the, uh, the priesthood and the temple for generations to come through all his sons that he has put in place after him. I think we're going to see though when he gets deposed as well. <laughs> meanwhile, um, it's lots of meanwhiles now, because John the Baptist is still growing up as we read about in Luke's gospel. So the child kept growing, he became strong in spirit and he was in the wilderness until the day he was revealed to Israel. So he's in the wilderness is a, an interesting little statement because um, it implies that in some way or other that he's got some sort of connections with the Essenes who tended to withdraw to the wilderness. And whether that came through, uh, well, Zacharias, his father, served in the temple and the Essenes rejected the temple. So Zacharias couldn't have himself been an Essene, but of course they had influence. You didn't have to fully kind of buy in to, to do it. Um, but it, it probably is more likely that it's after his parents have died um, that he finds um, he... Uh, kind of a community within that sort of desert dwelling those desert dwelling groups so we don't know for a hundred percent that he wasn't a scene but as i pointed out i think no it wasn't here sorry <laughs> i've pointed out elsewhere if you look at the, the the different synoptic gospels one describes him as coming up out of the wilderness and preaching and others talk about people going into the wilderness to hear him preach and Bethabara, which is um, where where he does his baptizing, is right on the edge of the two. But if he has come up out of the wilderness, he's obviously been deep within it, if that makes sense. Um, and and Bethabara is only a few miles um, round um, round the Dead Sea um, from Qumran, which of course is a famous Essene community. But they have other communities in the wilderness. So in some way or other, he seems to have that kind of connection, or he's grown up with them. The, the, um, the Essenes actually have a form of baptism, but unlike John, they had a, a kind of theology that was about withdrawal, whereas John kind of comes and wants to engage. So there's something different in him. So he may have grown up with them and just seen it differently, or it may be that it's just an influence that he's had from them. Um, and Jesus, of course, is growing up. It says, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, it's filled with wisdom and the favour of God was on him. And then we come to the famous incident now, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. So the trouble with that statement, sorry, that sounds critical, doesn't it? I don't want to criticise the Bible. <laughs> I'm in trouble there. Might I? <laughs> but the, the trouble is, is as we put things together, um, it looks to me like Jesus is born around April to May time, as we saw the, the history. So the question is, therefore, when we say, what's what's Jesus's 12th year? Because <laughs> 7 AD, um, Jesus wouldn't yet quite be 12 at Passover. It's happening just before his birthday. Does that make sense? So he's not, it's not yet his 12th year if you count it from birthdays. But it is the 12th Roman year that he's been alive in. You see the, 
see why it's tricky. Mm -hmm. So we can't be 100% sure as we kind of put things together here. <laughs> um, the nice thing, if you, if you look at it this way, if, if, it, if it was 8 AD, <laughs> Jesus is almost 13. Um, that's actually the age at which he gets recognised as an adult. So that's worth right. kind of saying. Yeah, but, and um, I don't know if they had bar mitzvahs in Jesus' day, but it's kind of the transition period in people's thinking. Um, we, we're told that when he returns, he re stays in subjection under his parents. And even when someone goes to their bar mitzvah, they don't dismiss their parents. So he, he kind of, but, but it seems that he is at about this transition period from childhood to adulthood, where we have the incident at the temple. Which is interesting because in, in Jewish thinking of the time, the, it, within the Jewish traditions, the Jewish traditions <laughs> tell us that Samuel um, enters into service in the temple at the age of 12. Um, so it's kind of, it ties Jesus a little bit with Samuel. Uh, and Samuel is seen in, in Judaism as being the prophet who comes after Moses. Moses prophesies a prophet who will come after him, who we see ultimately in Jesus. Mm -hmm. But Judaism looks back and says, ah, oh, well, the prophet that comes after Moses is Samuel. Samuel enters service at about the age of 12. So um, I, I am 100% sure because I'm sure that, that Luke is thoroughly Jewish, um, even though that's not necessarily the popular opinion of today. <laughs> I think he is a thoroughly Jewish. He's a Hellenized Jew. I think that, that Luke writes a lot of in things in his gospel. He doesn't draw them out because he's writing for a non-Jewish audience, but he himself knows them. So he, he's included this story and he's included the touch that Jesus is in his 12th year that makes him a bit like Samuel. I know that. I know that you don't get it, but I can't help myself. I'm still going to write it because I get it. It's kind of <laughs> so I'm writing for the Greek thinking world because Paul's using my gospel as he takes it around. But I still want you to. Kn I still know that. I can still see the connection and so on. Um, so anyway, they, they've gone down, as we know the story. It's a four or five day walk. Um, they'd be part of a large group of pilgrims. There's probably a whole crowd going down from Nazareth. They will travel down. Jesus has done this year by year, and as he gets nearer to kind of adulthood, um, there is no kind of question or worry in his um, uh, in his parents' mind that he's just travelling with them. So we we know the know the story. But when the feast was over and they were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents didn't know it. So I put the full Passover and subsequent feast of unleavened bread last seven days. So Jesus has probably been with lots of friends down in Jerusalem. It's all a big party atmosphere before they all start heading home because they assumed that he was in their group of travellers. And they went a day's journey and then they began to look for him um, amongst their relatives and their acquaintances. And obviously they start to become aware. And when they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. So after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. So this is going to be around April the 1st or April the 12th. April the 1st, if it's 7 AD, April 12th, it's 8 AD. Um, they find him there. And of course, you know, we, we know the story all heard. Jesus were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were overwhelmed. His mother said, you treated us like this. Look, your father, I've been looking for you anxiously, but he replied, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? Uh, but his parents didn't understand the remark that he made to them. And he went down with them and he came to Nazareth and he was obedient to him. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. Um, and, and of course, in many ways, now this is the closing verse that we have on Jesus. So there's a few things to note in the years that are going to intervene before we meet him again. But uh, this kind of point where he's just leaving childhood in his 12th year, and he's about to become a young adult. Um, he's beginning in that, in that transition where he's now thinking independently. Um, he's, he's being noticed because he has a remarkable way of seeing things. Um, there's a it's kind of supernatural wisdom in him. Um, he's probably got an intuitive understanding for, by the Holy Spirit. Um, but um, that he is wise beyond his years he is not it's not a total kind of uh, divine wisdom you know there are things that jesus doesn't know in his humanity because he is living in humanity and as a child as he grows but it's making a mark and uh and so that we leave him therefore around um seven or eight a.d so what goes on after that <laughs> sorry Where are we Jesus grows in wisdom, character and favour. So um, Caesar Augustus dies in August 19th in 14 AD. 
Um, so and Tiberius becomes the emperor on the 18th. Um, and in Jerusalem, um, Valerius Gratus, who's Pilate's predecessor, deposes Annas. Um, so Annas, who was made high priest, gets deposed um, in eight, uh, sorry, 14 AD. But of course, the, the Torah assumes that a high priest is a high priest for life. Um, and so politically, he's been removed. But in, in people's minds, he's still the high priest. Um, and the Romans now appoint new high priests. And we get this strange situation, of course, that we encounter in the gospel where there are two high priests. And because Annas kind of dominates the priesthood for over a generation, um, even the, as rabbis look back, they, they refer to the sons of Annas. They, he's the one that stands out. Caiaphas just gets absorbed into the dynasty that Annas sets up. And through that whole period, Annas behaves as the high priest, even though technically he is not in and the Romans don't see him that way. Um, his first son, Eleazar, is installed in his place, but he dies soon after that. And it's after Eleazar that um, his son-in-law, Joseph ben Caiaphas, um, is appointed high priest in 18 AD. So the scene is beginning to get set now for the story that we know, um, Jesus' ministry. Um, Tiberius, in 26 AD, retires to Capri. Um, <coughs> And that, that's actually going to shape the shape of Jesus' ministry in the gospel. And because he leaves the, the, the empire in the hands of a guy called Lucius Sejanus, um, who's from the Praetorian Guard and has a very violent tendency. And um, there are uh, there's a whole run of very violent generals who rise to the top positions in Rome. Um, they, they, you know, they are a military empire and it, and it tends to be the soldiers that, that rise to the top. He um, and he he dis Sejanus um, consolidates power and starts drawing in favours to himself. Starts drawing power to himself as the emperor has retired, and he actually himself um, doesn't like Jews. Got that there? He, he he dislikes the Jews because he sees them as insubordinate in the terms of the way they they won't honour the kind of Roman ways. And Jerusalem rejects um, any images coming in to to Jerusalem or to the temple, and he actually appoints Pilate to become prefect of Judea. So Pilate turns up, if you like, under the watch of Sejanus, who is anti-Jewish. And he comes in with a very blasé attitude, which is basically, I'm not going to be in any trouble for anything I do here, because the, the guy that I answer to, because Tiberius has disappeared, um, he, will, he will approve of anything I do to you. Um, so he, he comes in, he introduces the Roman standards into Jerusalem. They're embossed with the figure of the emperor on them. It turns into five days of protest. He backs down in December. He does back down, but he, he kind of is, in his early years, Pilate is constantly antagonising um, the Jewish authorities. Uh, Philo comments on Pilate's vindictiveness. He's got his furious temper. He says that he was naturally inflexible. He's self-willed and relentless. His corruption in his acts of violence, of insolence, rapine, and his habit of insulting people, and his cruelty and his continual murders of people, untried and uncondemned his never-ending gratuitous and most grievous inhumanity i put it there but but the thing is by the time that of jesus's death he's actually become pliable and i think this might be my last slide yeah it is <laughs> uh, the 15th year of the reign of tiberius is the time when john the baptist comes out of the wilderness um, and uh, about what's going to happen between uh, john coming out of the wilderness and jesus um, his execution is that Tiberius is going to come out of retirement and he comes out of retirement in late 30s around that period which is which is why one of the, the many reasons why I'm sure that Jesus is crucified in 33 AD not 30 AD because you have to explain his change in, in attitude in that he is easy to manipulate by the Jewish authorities but in the beginning of his minister of his his um, prefecture or wherever it, where his governorship <laughs> um, he would have had no qualms of telling him to get lost um, but at the period um, at the, at the period that Tiberius comes back, everybody has to be on best behaviour, and there's a that change in regime. So those are uh, that's just part of the background. I don't know if anyone wants to ask anything. We've done it in rather. Sejanus, oh, sorry. Go on. Go ahead. Sejanus gets purged then. The yes, he does. Yeah, he gets Tiberius executed gets when Tiberius. Yeah, <laughs> um, and uh, he, he, he Tiberius doesn't come back because he's anti-Semitic. He comes back because he he gets told that basically he's about to They're kind of do a coup, to, yeah. and um, if you don't come back, then he'll he'll uh, he'll succeed. So he comes back. Good. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I think 
question, and it's kind of between Jesus' ministry and his childhood. And that is that John the Baptist, um, Mary went to Elizabeth. Yeah. And I don't think they lived that far away from each other. And um, we we but, don't know at all really because um, you know, she she takes a trip away and it's obviously. Um, and she's there for three months. If it was only a, a short distance, they might she might have buzzed backwards and forwards. So it seems like it's a distance, but we have no idea in what direction. So. But the question, though, that I have is that at Jesus' baptism, no, um, John had to have been aware of Jesus being his cousin if his mother went to visit. Um, yes, well, the... Um, so the question, though, yeah. is... Um, but he didn't know who Jesus was or didn't appear to at the baptism. Yeah. And I'm wondering how that's quite possible. Okay, so um, <laughs> he, he talks about not, not knowing. The, the, the phrasing, you can't tell whether he means he doesn't realise that this guy was the Messiah or if I don't know who he is um, in, the, in the wording of, of what John says. Um, I tend to think it probably means he, he's probably vaguely aware of who Jesus is. But if, if as I suspect, is his... Um, uh, Elizabeth actually is, is not totally next to Nazareth because I think if they were totally next to it um, Mary might have buzzed down to see her every now and again it sounds like she has to take a bit of a journey then of course they spend two years in Egypt and they come back um, and they, they're an oldly elderly couple we don't know at what point they've died what point Joe's, John now is is growing up and the other thing we don't know is is whether John is a first or second cousin and because the um, uh, Hebrew is is kind of vaguer on that than than English, you know. So I have uh, I, I remember um, being at school one day in my third year at secondary school, and a little first year old girl came up to me. She said, "You're my cousin," and it turned out I had no idea who she was. It turned out she was right because <laughs> um, one of my mum's sisters married a, a Greek guy, and um, in Greek culture they all knew who their second and third cousins were. Um, and so I was one of those, you know, it's just one of those things. And actually, it's similar in in in, in Jewish culture that um, she's referred to as your relative. So she could be a cousin or a second cousin. We don't know how close. Um, I, I'm putting all the bits together because in the end, you can't be 100 percent, but you try and put all the bits together. It feels um, that, that that she's not too distant, but that actually there's not a closeness growing up between Jesus and John. It's not kind of, oh, my, my cousin, I didn't see him for a year. Um, but then, but um, sorry again. Uh, uh, familial relationships are, are are very important, even if you've not met the person. So you tend to be able to establish it. That's why you learn your genealogy. So I learn my genealogy because then I meet a stranger, um, and uh, and we kind of work out at what point we connect. You know, that almost everybody who lives around you, you can find a connection with if you go back five or six generations. You know, that's the way it works. That's part of the reason why ancient cultures learnt genealogies, you see. So so I think that Jesus and John would be at least aware of each other but, um, because of different histories and so on, how close they would have known each other. So when Jesus comes, it may even be, I kind of am aware that actually you're part of my wider family group. But what I think John means is he, he didn't understand until he <coughs> saw the spirit coming on him. Actually, this guy... Is the one I've been sent to um, probably proclaim the way of cousin following John anyway, because yes, that's true. That large families, and when I sort of know it from my Indian connections, how family dynamics work. Yeah, clanic. Yes, that was a really good point, yeah. and yeah, and because uh, as we've seen with Jesus, actually several of his disciples are are are, um, are cousins and yeah. brothers, <laughs> and so on. He would know through the Spirit that he was the Messiah because. It says that that's right. Yes, he met in his mother's womb. He's met in his mother's womb. Yeah. Met. Yeah, and he no. waits. Well, he says it's when. So you think that the Holy Spirit would have been. Which is how he sent. he says he knows it. He says I, mm -hmm. when I saw the Spirit descending on him, it's, that seems to be the point where, aha, okay, this is this is the person mm -hmm. that I came to proclaim. But good. Mm. Any other questions? Well, about the baptism side, the place you mentioned earlier is called Dar, was it? Bethabara. Bethabara. Is that what they call the, the what they're using now as a traditional site? Um, well, okay. In most of there, but I don't know if it's Bethabara. Yeah. The um the most um most most Bibles, if you look at the maps at the back, will show you a place called Bethany beyond the Jordan, um, and it's a little bit up towards Jericho. 
And it's basically because that's a sort of a place where you can cross the Jordan or it's reckoned that you could cross the Jordan. And um, uh, but the oldest manuscripts of John refer to the place as Bethabara, not Bethany. Uh, but nobody knew where Bethabara was until they is found on a, on a mosaic. So we know there really was a place called Bethabara and it's right at the join of the um, of where the, the Jordan runs into the Dead Sea. Yeah, because so I've been to the traditional site and I think is the same place. But yeah, so... Where the, or, the site in Jordan. <laughs> there's Jordan on the other side, isn't it? The, um... There's a site in Jordan where they've excavated where the Jordan used... Because it, it, it moves, you know, yeah. it moves. Yeah. Where they built a church over the... Uh, the River Jordan. Yeah, that's yeah. the same site. Is, that, is yeah. that the one? Yeah. <laughs> and... and uh, that's, if you like, the church's traditional site of where right, yeah. Jesus was baptised. Yeah. So, but it's all in that area. It's all that area, yeah, down yeah, at the base. That, base yeah. That, and that's where um, Elijah was taken to heaven. Exactly, well. yeah, there's, so, there's other traditions to that yeah, region. And, so. and the people crossed over to Jericho, and the, so, yeah. so it has a big spiritual significance. It does, yeah, which I, I think is I think is part of the, the baptism kind of uh, symbolism with, that Jesus well, involved in. John the Baptist is baptising me. I was baptising people there in February and I got the flu as a result. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 but you know, you were, were, the thing is, Howard, were you wearing a, a, a garment of camel hair? <laughs> no, See, that's, that's your problem. <laughs> that, that was your problem. <laughs> All year round with a, with a camel hair garment. That's the, that's the way it goes. I'm going to stop the recording now, mate. <laughs>